So we've been going through that book called Revelation. Uh, no S at the end, not Revelations. Revelation, as we said, there's one revelation, and that is of who Christ is, who he is and what he did, what he is doing, and what he will do, because he is the God who was, who is, and is to come. And so our big series that we've been doing is called What Every Christian Needs to Know About the often misunderstood and misused book of Revelation, Beasts, Dragons, and Scary Horsemen. Oh my, I hope you're excited. Today we actually get to those scary horsemen. And my apologies, I forgot to do it. Some of you, any Johnny Cash fans in the house? Okay, some of you would probably remember that song, God's Gonna Cut You Down. And at the beginning, he's like, and death rode on a pale horse. And hell hollowed behind him. And everyone's like, ooh, goosebumps. And then he starts singing. So that's the verse we're going to be looking at today. So if you're a Johnny Cash fan, uh, you're really going to enjoy it this morning. We might put this in a little better context than Johnny did in his song. But, hey, we still love him. So looking at Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. So we're going to, through two chapters today. Well, it should only be here about two hours. Shouldn't be too bad. But today's message, the four horsemen, the lamb, and the tears of the saints. And, and last week, we looked at who is the lamb. We looked at last week that John was in heaven, and, and there was a scroll that was, was given. And it was given from the throne room, of, from the throne itself. So God gave this scroll. They didn't have books, so these things were rolled up. And there's writing on the inside and the outside, so there was a lot. God has a lot to say. Think an infant God has a lot to say? Yes, he does. And around that scroll were the seven seals, and the seven seals get you caught up if you weren't with us last week, and you can listen to the full thing on YouTube. They would have these wax seals that they put on it, and those were generally by witnesses. And so they would often have a, a string that would go around it, and it would be going through these pieces of wax, and each witness would, would put their, their seal or their ring, their insignia, in that wax. And so we're seeing this symbolic picture of, of God's giving his purposes. He's giving his plans. And there's these different things that, that will, will happen that will give witness to the fact that what God says will happen will happen, that it's, it's okay. And what's fun is, is we see someone says, who's worthy, who's, will, who's able to actually know what God is desiring to do? Who can actually open this scroll? Who has the authority to open the scroll that is from the throne of God? And someone said the, the Lion of Judah, and we know that picture from the, the Old Testament, this picture of the victor that would come, that would overthrow the world, that would establish God's people forever. And John's excited, the Lion of Judah, yes. And as he looks for this roaring lion, and, and lions were often a picture of military might and dominance, and he's like, yes, let's look for that lion. And as he looks, instead what he sees is a lamb. The lion was a lamb. And not only was it a lamb, it was a lamb that had been slaughtered. It was a lamb that was purely flawless and had been slaughtered, been cut. And that lamb was worthy to open the words and unfold them to humanity, the fullness of God. And as we know, that was Christ. So as we read, uh, you're caught up. Jesus is the lamb of God. To Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. So this vision continues on. Starting in verse 1, and John says, As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with voice like thunder, Come! And I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow, and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come! And then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. When the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come! I looked up and I saw a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand, and you might be thinking the scales of, of justice, where you got the one on the other. That probably wouldn't have been the case. It would have been like a rope with an iron bar, most likely on it, and it would have been used to attach uh, satchels of, of wheat or barley to, to weigh that. 
scales in his hand, and I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and wine. See, in this bleak picture of, of food becoming so uh, scarce and, and unaffordable. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come! If we remember, those, those living beings represent all of creation. So we get this picture of, of creation itself. Is, is These things are happening in all of creation. Come, and I looked up and I saw a horse whose color was pale green. And some translations will just say a pale horse. And its rider was named Death. And his companion was the grave, or Hades, as some of the translations might read. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. This is a dark, bleak picture that we see here. So just a couple quick points. This is not just about future suffering. Some people will take these and say these are future events to come. How many of you know there have been conquerors and wars and pestilence and famine and disease since the beginning of humans recording history. We see a picture here of, of that first writer of conquest. We see that first picture of, of that human lust and desire for power. And, and that, that desire to conquer leads to war, and war leads to famine, and then you have disease, and you have natural disasters and animals that you can't control. This is a picture of not just what is to come, but it's a picture of what was and what is. We're getting a, a spiritual, a heaven's view of what happens in this fallen, broken, sinful world. Verse 9, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God, for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us. So we first see the picture of the brokenness of this world, that is. And then we see a picture, and, and this is kind of a big deal. The, the, so the, this picture of the, the martyrs, those that would give their lives for Christ, John's giving them a warning. This was an original audience who was receiving this message. At this point, these seven churches had only had one person killed for their faith that we know of. Now, in the church of Jerusalem, we saw that Stephen had been martyred, but in these seven churches, the initial people they were getting, they only knew of one person. They, some of them were losing their jobs, but in other places, they were fine because we saw the warning that, hey, you're too fine with the world around you. And so this was a cautionary, it was letting them know that, that there would be persecution, that there would be those that, because of their choice to follow Christ, they would lose their life. And what's interesting, we don't see them, uh, we see this unusual picture where before the saints are in white robes, we'll see that again in the throne room of heaven, but they're under the altar, and, and a lot of scholars believe that has to do with uh, kind of a, a parallel to when a, a lamb was slaughtered and its blood went and was put on the altar and it would flow underneath. But also this reality under the altar, meaning that these are the cries of those that are suffering, that will suffer here on earth. And just a, a really, I think, an important thing to note here. We hear their prayer here. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord and holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? How many of you have been frustrated in your life with the world around you and you've prayed prayers of frustration? So just a, a point, and I, I love this, Dr. Craig Keener, he's a New Testament Bible scholar, said he points out that this is an honest reflection of how human hearts and minds under extreme duress might pray out to God. It's not a prescriptive, it's not saying this is how we should pray. But in those moments, we will be frustrated. And, and there will they, that church, they would be going through moments where they're being persecuted and their loved ones have been killed. And they're saying, God, how long till you avenge us? And I think what this does is it shows us it's okay to be frustrated with how things are. It's okay to not like the death and the destruction and the famine and the disease and the injustices of this world. It's okay to not like that. God doesn't like that himself. 
So verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. I love this, this picture here that no matter what happens in this life, he's reminding that we win in the end. We will share with Jesus in his victory over both sin and death. And there's, they was telling them that you're going to be frustrated in times in life and you're going to want God's judgment. You're going to want things to happen now. And just because they're not happening now doesn't mean that, what God is, that God isn't at work. It doesn't mean that God's not going to fulfill what he has promised. And so we see this admonition that, that those suffering in Christ, for Christ, we are to patiently trust and wait for him. And that picture of, and it's not that there's this um, set amount of people that have to die for Christ to come back. It's just saying that there's going to be more. There's going to be, as long as we are here in this broken world, until Christ comes back, there will be suffering in this world, and there will be those who will suffer for their faith in Christ. Verse 12, I watched the Lamb who broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood, and the stars of the sky fell on the earth like green Figs falling from a tree, shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. See, somebody's like, well, what happened? The mountains just got destroyed. Why are people hiding in the mountains? Well, we're getting this, again, it's a picture. You see this picture of, of the very uh, universe, the cosmos itself is being shaken by God. But not only that, but there's a spiritual aspect, the spiritual principality. So these mountains that get completely destroyed, it's, it's an image of a spiritual or, or earthly powers that dominate this world. So and it's kind of cool that mountains and islands, they're basically the same thing. An island's basically a mountain that starts in the bottom of the sea and comes up. And it takes a long time for them to build and to be established, and you think they cannot be moved. And what God is saying uh, right here is that those, those physical things of this world that have taken a long time, they've been established, those earthly powers, that, those spiritual powers that we think cannot be defeated, that can never come down, that we might even be tempted to put our trust and faith into, that God will inevitably lay them all to waste. We are to put our power, or sorry, to put our trust and hope in him and him alone. And so in the middle of, of chaos, in the middle of, of turmoil in this world, people will be looking, they'll be wanting to go to these mountains, so to speak. They'll say, well, we just need a better government. Well, we just need a better this. We just need more money. We just need uh, a stronger leader. And they will go to these things and these things will fail them every single time. All of these things will pass away. These powers and systems like islands and mountains may take a long time to form and rise, but they will crumble and fall to nothing, just as Greece did, just as Rome did, just as Nazi Germany did, just as every nation. And I don't want to scare anyone. I love our country, but it's a human thing. We must put our hope and trust in Christ and not human things. Because every human thing is corruptible. Every human thing is not perfect. And in the end, God is the King. He is our authority. He is our Lord. And He will lay waste to everything that tries to take glory from Him. Verse 16. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? We see this, this call to those that would suffer. 
not just to those seven churches, but to the church as a whole, that's saying, God is just. God is just. And God is on his throne. He has all authority. He will move. Justice will be lived out. Mercy, thank goodness, will be lived out. I always encourage us, don't be so quick to ask God to throw his wrath on other people. Perhaps we should be saying, God, pour out your mercy. Because the reality is, anyone that has not stepped into and received the mercy of God, just the natural consequences, those mountains will fall. Sin does bring death. The four horsemen are running around, so to speak. And those that are in Christ are safe, are secure, have hope, have a purpose. And those who are not are going to reap those natural consequences. And that lamb that was slain is also that conquering lion. And God is reclaiming his creation. He's redeeming his people who have been lost. He's setting the captives free. So what do we do with this? Remember that the lamb that was slain was Jesus He's the only one with the authority to, to open these seals, which is kind of a big deal. So, so Jesus, who's opening these seals, and these seals are revealing these horrible things that are happening, right? What do we do with this? What it's telling us is, yes, there's crazy stuff going in this world, but he is still in authority. He is still over and above it all. He is not surprised by it. That God said, yes, this is happening, but I'm allowing it to happen because I have a bigger, better purpose for you. I'm not allowing anything to happen to you that, that I cannot redeem, that I cannot save, that I cannot restore. God was not afraid to let death happen to Jesus because he had the power to resurrect Christ. He's not afraid to let things happen to us because he has the power to resurrect us. Things will happen in this world. Things do happen, have always happened, will happen, maybe for better, maybe for worse, but we don't have to worry. A lot of people look at the book of Revelation and like think of it as the book of worry. These are all the things we've got to worry about. No, the book is saying, yes, it's, admonish, it's recognizing, yes, there are things to worry about, but we don't have to worry about them because of who is on the throne. We don't have to freak out and wonder if God has abandoned us. He hasn't abandoned us. He is the one, Jesus is the one holding the authority and the power of God in his hand. He knows these things are happening, and as these things are happening, instead of freaking us out, it should be a reminder that God is in control. He said these things would happen. He has a plan already for them. These four horsemen, the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, would be a great metal band. Sorry. For a lot of people, this is some scary stuff. It's a scary picture. So let's go on into... Chapter 7 here, which gives us the rest of this picture. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying the seal of the living God. And he shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm land and sea, Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the four hands of his servants. And kind of going back, we already saw that picture of those, those other four horsemen who were given authority to slaughter a fourth. And it didn't mean a literal fourth. It just means that a fraction of everything we see around us is at any given time not going to be good. There's always going to be a part of life, a part of reality that is in hurting, that is in turmoil, that's in war, that is dying in famine. And we see here that, but that God is, is saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be faithful. Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we've placed the seal of God on the foreheads of a servant. Basically saying, God, says, I'm not going to let this entire world fall and crumble until I have saved my people. 
And we're going to see again this picture of every tongue, every tribe, every nation. But it starts first, goes on in verse 4. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. From Judah, 12,000. From Reuben, 12,000. From Gad, 12,000. From Asher, 12,000. I'll let you read the rest of those on your own. 12,000 until we get to 144,000. Now, this passage has been used by different church groups and different people trying to figure out who those 144,000 are and think if you're not part of the 144,000, you can't go to heaven. The 144,000 number here is a symbol. There were, that 12 was very significant in, in the Hebrew people. And so this picture of 12,000 meaning a big bunch, a perfect amount of all of God's people, of the Hebrew people, God would fulfill his promise to them. That there would be people saved. A remnant would be saved. That would be his people. His people would continue to be his people. Even though they were unfaithful, God would fulfill his covenant to them. That there will be in the presence of God. That's exciting. But then it goes on from there. Because when God keeps a promise, it's always better than we can conceive. Like if God had just kept his promise to those that were part of the nation of Israel. That would be great. He kept his promise. But God's promises are always bigger and better than we can possibly think. And so he goes on in verse 9, after I saw a vast after this I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people in language, standing in front of the throne before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches. And we see that, that picture of, that uh, John put in, in the gospel of them waving palm branches as Jesus came into his kingdom. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. God not only is fulfilling his original promises to Abraham and to Moses and to all those we read in the Old Testament. But as we go back, his, his plan was always to redeem all of people, every descendant of Adam and Eve, all God's people, every tongue, every tribe, every people. And we see that they are all will be represented in the throne room of heaven. And I always like to remind people, if you notice, there's no assigned seating. You don't have the Catholics over here and the Lutherans over here and the Americans and the Russians over It's all one beautiful group mixed together. And they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the land. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground, worshiped God. And they sang, we saw this last week as well. All of creation, we, we worship, we worship with all of creation. We worship with those who have gone before us. We worship now, we worship with those who will come after us. And they sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God. If you need encouragement this week, I encourage you, as we did last week, go through this week these songs, these, these eternal songs that are, we see a picture of worship in heaven taking place. And pray through and sing them yourselves. Blessing and honor, glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I love this. Actually, the way he asked it is like, and where did they come from? He knows the answer. And then he said to me, or I, John said, I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. Now we see this vast amount of people from every tribe, every nation, every people group, every language. Languages come and go. Cultures rise and fall. But every single one of them will be standing before the throne of God 
And so this isn't a picture of a future tribulation, of a pr- future thing to come. Yes, there will be future tribulations, but there's tribulation happening now. There's suffering happening now. There's people martyred for their faith now. There's people that martyred then. And all of us equally will receive the reward that Christ has for us. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. And again, we go back to that, that victory of the Lamb. It was by Christ's death and resurrection. It was by His blood that was shed for us. We who shed blood on this world, who have ridden with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and you think, well, I never did it. Well, Jesus said in your mind, if you've thought about murdering someone, you've murdered someone. Every single one of us, through our sins and brokenness, we have said, come to the four Horsemen, we've said, come to, to destruction and death and sin. And yet Jesus came and he conquered those things. And so in him, by his blood, we are cleansed, we are made new. And we are given those white robes, those victor's robes, because we share with him. So all who have remained faithful to Jesus, even through the trials and tribulations of life, whether it be death, war, famine, disease will find victory with Christ. Those who have put their trust in Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, rather than compromising and or trusting more in the powers and the systems and the mountains of this world for hope and life and power, rather that those that will choose to stand before God, who have chose to receive, to allow the blood of the Lamb to cleanse us, to wash us, will be made right before God, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood was poured out for us, is our hope. And it goes on in verse 15, to wrapping up here. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. And they will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun, For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. If you would, I want us to stand together. I want us to look at that this week. To allow those words to come alive within us. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He is our shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. He leads us now to his spring of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes.